Hello everyone. In this video, I'm going to be talking about the role of the kidneys in osmoregulation, or the, the regulation of water, essentially. Now this is uh, the fourth video in a sequence that I've made entitled Kidneys for Key Stage 4, where I've been looking at the structure and function of the kidneys. So this one really is, is towards the end of that sort of sequence. In previous videos, I've talked about, if we look at this diagram on the left, I've talked about how you get filtration or ultrafiltration in the glomerulus, the ball of capillaries, leading to a filtrate passing through into the Bowman's capsule down here. I've talked about the proximal convoluted tubule, which is this segment here, where we've had selective reabsorption of things like glucose, amino acids, etc. And then in the third part of this video, I spoke about this section here, the loop of Henle. And the loop of Henle is where we get reabsorption of water and salt to a degree. Now what I'm going to do in this video, and I'll colour this in, in blue, is speak about this part here, the bit that I'm highlighting just now. Now this part of the nephron, the filtration unit of the kidney, is called the collecting duct. And it's through the collecting duct that ultimately the urine that we've been producing in the kidney is going to pass to the ureter and then into the bladder. But along the way, we're going to have that extra element of control in terms of the amount of water that we're actually going to have in that urine. So what I have on the right here it's essentially a, a flow chart, if you like, or two flow charts in one that I'm going to talk you through. Because we're going to imagine, if we start with the grey box in the centre, that we have the correct water potential in the blood. Now, if you think about just the person's daily activities, we're going to have lots of water losses through excretion of faeces, um, through respiration, through sweating, for example, and we're going to take in water by eating and drinking. But now we're going to look at two different scenarios. So we'll look at the left sort of side of boxes first. And I'll highlight this in, in red. If we imagine that there is too little water in the blood, so maybe we've lost a lot through sweating or there's a high concentration of salt, then our water potential is lower. So you'd find that your thirst, as you might guess, is increased. Now that change is detected and osmoreceptors of the hypothalamus are stimulated. Now the word osmo is really referring to water. So these are receptors that are detecting water levels in the blood. The hypothalamus is the part of the brain controlled in what's called homeostasis or the maintenance of a constant internal environment. So we're trying to maintain levels of, of many different things in terms of the blood and in the tissue fluid. And we're stimulating this hypothalamus because we're wanting to bring about a response. Now when we have this too little water and we, we get that detection and subsequent um, activation, if you like, of the osmoreceptors, what we get is the release of a hormone. Now that hormone is called ADH, or antidiuretic hormone, and it's the pituitary gland that secretes it. So the pituitary gland in the brain, if there's too little water, secretes ADH, or antidiuretic hormone. Now it's sometimes called, and I'm going to put this in red in brackets, it's sometimes called vasopressin. So if you see the word vasopressin, it means ADH. Now this hormone makes the collecting ducts, or the walls of the collecting ducts that I've highlighted in blue on the diagram to the left, more permeable to water. So you can draw a little line, or an arrow going down to there. So we're deliberately, if the water level in the blood is, is really low, 
and we're trying to save water, we want this hormone released because what ADH does, what this antidiuretic hormone does, is make the collective duct more permeable to water so we can reabsorb it. Now, this is a little bit of extra detail, maybe a bit beyond key stage four, but when this happens, when ADH is released, you get what are called aquaporins. So aqua, A-Q-U-A, and then porins, P-O-R-I-N-S. Aquaporins, they're the little proteins that go into the membranes of the cells of the collecting duct. And it's those aquaporins, or it's through those aquaporins that water can pass through. So water is actually reabsorbed back into the blood. So it passes, and I'll draw this in a sort of lighter blue colour on the diagram. So water is able to be reabsorbed back into these peritubular capillaries that I mentioned in a previous video. Now if we reabsorb more water back into the blood, then what we ultimately get is a very small volume of concentrated urine being formed. So that's what happens when we're trying to conserve water. When the water level is a bit lower, the kidneys will try and save as much as we can, so we're not losing it in the urine. Now let's think on the other side, and I'll use the green for this one. So if we start back in the middle at correct water potential, this time we're going to imagine that we have drunk too much. Or maybe there's too little salt concentration in the blood, so our water potential is higher. If we have a lot of water in the blood, and then all through this Pro, all through these processes rather in the kidney we're not really going to be reabsorbing that much because we're going to want to lose all that excess water if you like especially like in the loop of Henley where we reabsorb water we're not going to reabsorb as much as you would expect so in this instance as we've got in this diagram our thirst is reduced now that change again is detected but this time the osmoreceptors of the hypothalamus are not stimulated so because they're not stimulated, we're not getting this release of ADH. There's no antidiuretic hormone being produced. So if that's the case, then as I said on the, um, on the other side of this diagram, if we're not getting ADH being released, then these aquaporins, these proteins, don't go into the membranes of the collecting duct. They actually are within um, little vesicles within the cell and they move out to, to go into the membrane when they're trying to reabsorb water. So in this case, those um, aquaporin proteins don't go into the membrane. Now, as a result, the collecting duct is not so permeable to water. So less water can escape out of that collecting duct back into the blood circulation. So in that case, less water is reabsorbed back into the blood so we lose a lot of water down the collecting duct, and so we produce a large volume of dilute urine. And that's really the, the role that the kidney plays in osmoregulation and the control of water in the blood. It's an overarching really part of, as I said, homeostasis, maintaining a constant internal environment in the body. And it's really the last part of... Um, the job of the kidneys. So we've had ultrafiltration at the top, producing a filtrate. We've selectively reabsorbed things like amino acids um, and glucose and salt to a degree. So we've just been left with really water and salts and urea, which is a waste. In the loop of Henley, we've been reabsorbing some of that water and salt via diffusion. We had tubular secretion in the distal convoluted tubule which helps to balance pH. And then finally, in this video, what I've talked about is the collecting duct and how the kidneys help to play a part in controlling water level through either secreting ADH, antidiuretic hormone, or not secreting this ADH. Okay, hope all that helps.